again, astronauts. Eris managed to find another video to react to, so I'm here to watch episode three of the historical fiction series, Ancient Apocalypse. Welcome to Bad Astra. What? Netflix put it under documentaries? That must be a mistake, right? Right? Welcome to our Wacky Science channel, where we talk about space, physics, and combat science misinformation with more costume changes than math. I'm Astra. I have a BA in physics, an MS in mechanical engineering, and the habit of screaming about pseudoscience. Eris, a chaotic witch and our writer, sent me the nonsense pseudoscience I'll be reacting to today and wrote most of this script. Thank you so much for watching, and we'd really appreciate it if you like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. I read them all and try to respond to most of them. If you really love our videos and want to support us paying for increasingly elaborate costumes, props, locations, and filming equipment, we have a Patreon where you can sign up to get early access to our videos, behind the scenes updates, blooper reels, and other fun perks. Okay. Time to take a look at the high-budget equivalent of a white guy repeating what he heard on Joe Rogan's podcast for eight episodes. Front of the line for decades, and, and you exposed me to a lot of these controversial ideas that have now been substantiated. Well, I'm... Oh no. That's the host of this show. That was supposed to be just a tough joke. For those of you who don't know, Ancient Apocalypse is a documentary hosted by Graham Hancock that was recently released on Netflix. Its central premise is that there was a lost civilization, <coughs> Atlantis, <coughs> that was far more advanced than the simple hunter-gatherer societies, but they were lost to a great flood. He presents evidence? But the episode we're focusing in on involves investigating temples and caves in Malta for evidence of human presence during the Ice Age, much earlier than archaeologists currently believe humans were in Malta, which will eventually tie into his Atlantis conspiracy theory. Big archaeology is hiding the truth of Atlantis. One of the problems I have with the mainstream view, mainstream view of the development of civilization is the notion that our own civilization in the 21st century is the apex and the pinnacle of human achievement. This makes us very conceited. It makes us very big-headed. We look back on the past as though our ancestors were always simpler than us, had less knowledge than us, had less ability than us. Okay, so I couldn't get past the introduction without finding something to complain about, so this is going to be a wild ride. Here's the thing, we don't view humans that came before us as stupider or simpler. We view them as having less knowledge because the greatest technology that humans have, the thing that separates us from other species, is our ability to pass along information. The introduction to this episode is designed to prime the viewer to distrust archeological consensus and make Graham seem like an underdog whose evidence is being repressed. Graham is not an archeologist or a scientist. He's a journalist with a sociology degree. I would recommend you be wary of any science documentary which aggressively paints scientists as antagonists. Already we're in shady territory when he's discussing Gigantia, a megalithic temple in Malta from the Neolithic era. Well, Graham puts that timeline into question because there are no reliable carbon dates or writing to pinpoint when the temple was constructed. 
Does he have evidence to back up that claim? No. Is a lot of archaeology based on extrapolating from a small amount of data and hoping for the best? Absolutely. However, the artifacts found in the temple date to the Neolithic era, so it's a pretty safe assumption that the temple was built and that the artifacts were in the temple very soon after. The Neolithic era. Graham says that he thinks the artifacts were a lot younger than the temple and were placed there many centuries later, which there's no evidence to prove that this is more likely and it goes in flagrant violation of Occam's razor. It's almost as if, hear me out, he's doing the reach and grab stretches from our scientific bias video. Now it's time for my favorite exercise, confirmation bias stretches. You're gonna start with your feet a bit more than shoulder width apart. Then you're gonna reach up and to your left, grabbing the back conclusion you want while ignoring a whole bunch of data points based on hypocritical assumptions. Yeah, that feels good. Now, do the same thing over on your right, reaching for that narrative you want while ignoring a whole bunch of evidence that says you're wrong about the link between obesity and mortality rates. Oh yeah. Keep doing this until you get the answer you want. Not necessarily the correct one. You should feel a good stretch in your sides and in your study's conclusions. But more importantly, the giant myth of the Maltese people is pretty cool. An ancient legend here concerning a giantess called Sunsuna. It's said that the giantess had intercourse with one of the men of this land and gave birth to a hybrid child. Afterwards, to commemorate the event, she built this massive temple in a single day and night, carrying the child on her shoulder. I'm fascinated by this legend. Is anybody else getting Attack on Titan vibes? But how did these giants get to Malta to build Gigantia? By walking from Sicily during the Ice Age. This theory of earlier humans walking to Malta over a land bridge when sea levels were over 100 meters lower is technically plausible, since we know humans were in Sicily at the time. But why does Graham think this is more likely than humans arriving thousands of years later by boat over water, which we know they had the technology to do at the time? Because a few Neanderthal teeth were found in a cave in a layer associated with the Paleolithic rather than Neolithic period. Maybe. Whether the teeth were from a Neanderthal or just a modern human with pteranodont molars, and whether they were from the older Paleolithic or more recent Neolithic layer is actually the subject of confusion, since different dating tests have yielded different results and cataloging errors were much more common in 1917 when the teeth were discovered. It's not that the results were covered up, as Graham asserts. In fact, these teeth have been discussed and tested by archaeologists for a century, but they weren't seen as conclusive evidence. And since there is no other evidence for early humans on Malta before 3600 BC, the archaeological consensus is that humans most likely arrived on Malta via boat around that time. Sure, further study is definitely needed, but portraying these teeth as a smoking gun and archaeologists as covering up the paradigm-shifting evidence is misleading. If you want to read even further about all of the nonsense in this episode, I highly recommend the review of this episode by Carl Fegans, who is an archaeologist at the U.S. Forest Service. He does an incredible job of breaking down even more of the issues with this episode than we could get to, and I highly recommend it as reading. However, the man-made cart tracks, which crisscross all over Malta, are present in other areas around the Mediterranean and often extend underwater, implying that humans were there when sea levels were a lot lower, is compelling evidence. I would actually like to see further study into these underwater cart tracks to see how deep they go and potentially infer when they were carved based on the sea level at the time. Based on other sources I looked at, these tracks were likely used to help carts transport stones from quarries to the temples, 
So this is probably the most compelling evidence of earlier humans in Malta than anything else in this episode. Moving on, we learn about a fascinating and little known movement in the sky called precession. Okay, this is actually a fun fact. We'll give Graham the benefit of the doubt and say that yes, most people may not know that the Earth is not a perfect sphere and the axis causes a slight wobble that shifts our skies every 26,000 years. And yes, the position of the star would move by one degree approximately every 72 years. These descriptions are, in fact, correct. However, they use these facts to set up their theory that these temples were built long before the time span of 3600 to 2600 BC, which is the dating that archaeologists have given these temples according to their peer-reviewed research. The links to those studies are down below, since we couldn't find any studies to support any of Graham's claims. Spoiler alert. However, using state-of-the-art software to rewind the clock. Wait, zoom in. He's literally just using Worldwide Telescope in the documentary. It's free software anyone can access, which is awesome. But I'd hardly call it, like, state-of-the-art. <laughs> Anyways, Graham and his friend, who is also not an astronomer or an archaeologist, discovered that apparently the temples which face slightly different directions all line up with one star. If you account for that star's precession, or where it would have been in the sky at different times as the sky shifted about one degree every 72 years. But this would place the temple's construction much earlier than big archeology span thinks. Well, they could have all aligned with Sirius, the brightest star in the sky and subject of our Sirius love song serenade, at time of construction. Assuming the temples were built dating back 11,000 years ago, which would have been before early humans were thought to have first arrived in Malta. What an incredible discovery, and how neat that two hobbyists put that together using free, publicly available software. If Sirius was the only star that fit this series of growing temples, when looking at an archaeological timeline from 3600 to 2600 BC, Robert Peter Barrett, an archaeologist whose entire PhD focus is on these temples, wrote an article called The Crux of Astronomical Alignment in Neolithic Malta, using 3D simulation to produce new data, in which he found that the constellation Crux, the cross, fits the alignment of these temples, assuming they were constructed between 3600 and 2600 BC. This is a piece of evidence which supports the current consensus and is purposely left out of this episode. Graham could have talked to Barrett, an expert in the field with published work in major scientific journals, but apparently a conspiracy peddling translator who only seems to exist on Graham's website was easier. While we're on the subject of misleading astronomy, let's talk about the related conspiracy theory that Graham has his hands all over, Orion Correlation Theory. It's a major crux of Graham's work over the years and is widely regarded as bullshit by astronomers. The theory is that the pyramids are aligned with the stars in Orion's belt. However, they don't align as perfectly as Graham and his colleagues claim. They estimate 47 to 50 degrees per the planetarium measurements compared to the 38 degree angle formed by the pyramids. They go further to claim that the Sphinx is Leo, and on the map of the heavens that is the pyramids and the Sphinx, the Milky Way lines up with the Nile. It all connects. Except for how Krupp and Farrell found other problems with their arguments, including noting that if the Sphinx is meant to represent the constellation of Leo, then it should be on the opposite side of the Nile, the Milky Way, from the pyramids, Orion. But the vernal equinox, circa 10,500 BC, was in Virgo and not Leo, and that in any case, the constellations of the Zodiac originate from Mesopotamia and were completely unknown in Egypt until the much later Greco-Roman era. Even after adjusting the Orion theory so that they inverted the belt and age up the Sphinx way older than the pyramids, there is still no evidence for this to be anything other than a bunch of guys who think they came up with something obvious, which a bunch of scientists who dedicate their entire lives to researching these structures just missed. Side note, 
Amateur astronomers are incredible and have made fantastic discoveries and contributions to both astronomy and astrophotography. This video is not to sass backyard astronomers who create beautiful images and spread the joy of this field beyond academia. However, I'm surprised that in a Netflix budget documentary with a section focused on astronomy, no actual astronomers were interviewed. Astronomers are so easy to interview. They'll agree to say QWERTY confirmed for zero dollars. Hey, John, you're an actual astrophysicist. Could mm -hmm. baryogenesis, uh, the mechanism that made more matter than antimatter in the universe, could that have been explained by a QWERTY? What's a QWERTY? It is an orgy of quarks. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, totally. Baryogenesis as a QWERTY confirmed? Confirmed, yeah. If you'd like to see interviews with real astronomers and other scientists, including an archaeologist, check out the Scientist Interviews playlist on our channel. But why does Graham's ancient civilization theory matter? Am I just mad because he's misusing astronomy? Maybe further research is needed to see whether the man-made channels or the teeth are really evidence of early humans on Malta. Sure, he's not an archaeologist and is spouting out some debunked stuff about Orion, but does that fully discredit what he says about the Malta temples and Sirius? And even if so, why should we care about whether someone thinks ancient people walked to Malta a few thousand years earlier when sea levels were lower? Whatever. Now, the juicy part. Atlantis is real and big archaeology wants to cover it up. I'm gonna try to do this with a straight face. Atlantis is real and big archaeology wants to cover it up. I tried. I tried with the delivery, Eris. Graham uses the teeth, cart tracks, and star alignment theories to jump to the conclusion that there was an ancient civilization traveling the globe, teaching all the separate ancient civilizations the secrets of the stars during the Ice Age. No joke. That's where this is all heading. Spoiler alert. He's using these Malta temples, which might align with the Crux or Sirius, to argue that not only does Atlantis exist, but they were the ones who taught our primitive ancestors before being lost to a great flood. Finally, we get to the Atlanteans. There are so many questions that need to be asked about this premise. Why couldn't these different indigenous cultures build these monuments on their own? Why doesn't Graham think it's possible for these cultures to look up and see the stars themselves? Why does he think these indigenous cultures were more primitive and less able to build these architectural marvels than these mythical Atlanteans? If the Atlanteans could travel the world teaching everyone agriculture, why were they taken out by a flood? Also, when you imagine someone from Atlantis, what do they look like? Are they white? Funny how that happens. It's almost as if people have thought Atlanteans were white since the Nazi pseudo-archaeologists claimed that the Aryan race originated from Atlanteans. Looks like we're back to the racist pseudoscience again. Unless you were thinking of the Disney Atlanteans, which had darker skin and were probably more historically accurate. Wait, what? Eris, what did I just read? It's Atlantis. You can't say anything about Atlanteans is historically accurate. They are a fictional civilization featured in a Disney movie. This isn't about whether Jesus was white. This is about whether mermaids are... I heard it as I said it. Archaeologist Flint Dibble points out how Graham is doing nothing new when it comes to disrupting the paradigm or whatever. He's just repackaging the work of Ignatius Donnelly, who also believed in Atlantis and white supremacy. Donnelly also promoted the theory of Atlanteans teaching indigenous cultures about architecture and civilizing them before a great flood came to wipe out the Atlanteans, who he also claimed were the origins of the Aryan race. Big yikes to that! Not only does Graham repackage this 1882 theory, but he directly cites it in his 1995 book, Fingerprints of the Gods, with this gem of big racist energy. The road system and the sophisticated architecture had been ancient in the time of the Incas, but that both were the work of white auburn-haired men. What the actual fuck is this? 
His essay is even worse and explicitly racist, even though these theories have been debunked time and time again. Ancient aliens, Atlantis reborn, and now ancient apocalypse are not big archaeology keeping the truth from us. It's an insidious plot to make white supremacist conspiracy theories consumable to a general audience. It consistently undermines the brilliance of indigenous populations who built some of the greatest wonders of the world without white people or aliens. Ironic, given the intro of this episode complaining about straw man historians and archaeologists underestimating the achievements of prior civilizations. In episode three, there are three experts referenced. One is Katja Stroud, a curator for Heritage Malta. She is the only credible expert, and she simply introduces the temples, probably without knowledge that her interview was being used to promote pseudoscience. The others are Lenny Rijek, who is the translator previously mentioned and is an author on a book regarding the serious conspiracy theory, despite having no archaeological or astronomical training, and Dr. Anton Misfit, who isn't an archaeologist, but a pediatrician. Possibly the first time where being an MD rather than a PhD actually gave someone less credibility. Our host, Graham Hancock, is a journalist with no background in archaeology and no peer-reviewed studies, but he is a frequent contributor to the Joe Rogan podcast, known for its fact-checking and rigorous guest standards. Graham has also done a TED Talk on his DMT use, but the TED Science Board had to move it exclusively to their website off of YouTube to properly contextualize it to highlight both Hancock's provocative ideas and the factual problems with his arguments. He's not known for having the facts. He's simply another useful idiot. And I say that in the political sense, not as a personal attack. Well, maybe a little as a personal attack. People believe this nonsense because they want to feel smart. Academia has a history of being elitist, inaccessible, and discriminatory. So when scientists come off as condescending assholes, it makes sense that people want to prove them wrong. And Graham takes full advantage of this effect by using the introduction of this episode to paint archaeologists and historians as close-minded and patronizing, casting himself as the underdog so the audience will root for him and his wild theories. But the way to effectively prove scientific consensus wrong isn't to interview pediatricians about archaeology or share unvetted memes on Facebook. It's to perform science that's peer-reviewed. Read articles from nonpartisan sources that have gone through rigorous review processes. Or, if you don't like reading, just watch our videos and those by other science communicators who aren't making claims about scientists lying to you or big archaeology keeping results secret. If you don't know who the host of a show or documentary is, look them up to see who they are or what they believe. I wouldn't want to watch Ancient Apocalypse after learning Graham's background. Check for works cited and see whether those works are papers published in reputable journals or articles on reputable news sites. But that's a lot of work for the average person looking to be entertained while they learn something. Realistically, most people aren't going to independently research the hosts and featured experts of a big budget documentary. Seriously, the excessive drone shots and music were overkill. Not unless they plan to make YouTube content out of it. Netflix is at fault too for giving this guy a platform to spout his bullshit to a larger audience without vetting him. Because having high production value content on a streaming service with a higher barrier to entry than YouTube and a label of documentary gives this work credibility that it does not deserve. Graham didn't cite his sources, so we had to independently find and verify all the evidence he was referencing. But we do cite our sources, including the plethora debunking his claims. So if you want all of our research links, you can find them down below and through the hyperlinks in Dibble's article. Side note, what a cool name for an archaeologist. Flint Dibble deserves a Netflix special over Graham. Hell, we here at Bad Astra deserve a special before Graham. Seriously, Netflix, give us money so we can travel the world and talk about astronomy. We'd only interview qualified experts and probably a few dogs.
Okay, that's all we have on this very specific episode of Ancient Apocalypse. If you want us to do uh, more videos debunking the entire series, let us know. Uh, we might be able to get to that in the new year. Uh, we hope you all have a happy holiday season to those who celebrate and a very happy time off to those who don't. Thank you all so much for your support this year and thank you for helping us get monetized. We have one more video coming out this year and if you want more exclusive content and to support our overkill research fueled by our jealousy and anger towards someone who got a Netflix series over us, join our Patreon. Otherwise, like, comment, and subscribe for more thoroughly researched science content. Astra out. Astra, Astra, to the stars, to the stars.